the moral is that uh, uh, knowledge helps you to be prepared when there is a peril, but there are a lot of different ways of having that knowledge. And I wanna share what I have with you and uh, uh, we'll build on it and hope that it gets out into the community. So I am a meteorologist. My name is John Pollock. Uh, I was a forecaster, weather forecaster for the National Weather Service uh, from 1978 to 2009. And it was uh, right around Omaha and I got a lot of experience with uh, the uh, weather and climate around here. But since then I've uh, remained active in environmental stuff. I give talks about climate change and I also like to garden and bicycle. And uh, my uh, pronouns, I guess, are he, him, his. Okay, uh, the first part of the thing, uh, mostly meteorology. Uh, uh, first of all, my, the focus on climate change uh, is avoiding the worst consequences. But uh, what do the worst consequences mean? Uh, there's a lot of talk about, well, if we do something soon, we avoid the worst consequences. The trouble is, there are already consequences, and some of them are the worst consequences for the people that encounter them and get killed. So it's a relative term. Uh, another thing, and this is something that I saw a lot when I was working, people have different sensitivity about warning. For some people, uh, hearing a warning about anything is, or is just about overwhelming. Uh, we did have uh, one unfortunate person who had a pathological fear of thunderstorms. And anytime we had something like a 20% chance of showers in the forecast, we'd get an anxious call. There aren't going to be any thunderstorms, are there? And then there are the people that like to go out and chase tornadoes or play golf during thunderstorms who have a relatively low sensitivity to warnings. And this is true regardless of what it is. I just got to see it in weather, but uh, we get the full range of uh, personalities. So I'm going to go through uh, with the realizing that uh, we all have different sensitivities to this stuff and look at the meteorology first. Uh, and what consequences are we trying to avoid? And what one of the popular things that I've been hearing that I'm going to push against this morning, and I have been for a while, is what I call the polar vortex idea. And there has been some research that suggests that, uh, of course, as we get global warming, the uh, the poles are warming faster than the equator in the equatorial regions. Uh, that would weaken the jet stream and somehow that had cut loose the polar vortex and we'd start having more storms. And that's a very popular idea. Unfortunately, I think it's functioning more as an ink blot test than it is as a, uh, a statement about meteorology. Uh, people who think that there are going to be bad consequences to climate change, look at the storms, and boy, it's a nice simple narrative. We warm things up, the storms get worse, and by golly, we're seeing it right now. And the people who are not inclined toward that idea say, ah, it's always been like this. So I'm going to go down a list of stuff, and some of the things, especially the earlier ones that I talk about, are things that are probably not going to get perceptibly worse during our lifetimes, but that doesn't mean that it isn't a hazard right where you are, that you don't need to do anything about it. Uh, so in evaluating these hazards, one of the things that uh, uh, the climatologists look at is whether they're resulting from uh, sort of a one-way process or a balance between different things. So uh, 
the one way stuff relates to warming. The uh, everything's warming up. The poles are warming faster than the equator and the oceans are also warming up. And that turns out to be important too, uh, to meteorology. Uh, but what's it going to do? And for mid-latitude cool season storms, uh, which would be snowstorms or uh, kind of uh, stratiform, we call them rainstorms, the kind of stuff that they get in uh, uh, England or on the West Coast in the winter, uh, it's a mixed bag because as it gets warmer, the amount of moisture that the atmosphere can hold increases. So the storm can get wetter. However, if the jet stream is weakening, there's less energy to turn up a storm in the first place. So in general, uh, we're not seeing big trends as far as the intensity of storms. We are seeing that some of the southern latitudes and uh, uh, that if these storms affect, for example, the southwestern U.S., which gets a lot of their rain in the winter, and they depend on these storms, that can change because the latitude of the storms is moving uh, to, toward the poles as things warm up. Uh, Snowstorms, uh, again, it's a mixed bag because there's more moisture for the storms, but they may not be getting as intense. And uh, if it's warmer, there's less of the storm that's going to be snow. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see much of a trend, except right in, again, in the Southern fringe where it's barely cold enough to snow in the winter. In, in those cases, they're seeing fewer storms. Uh, what about the warm season? Well, in Nebraska, that means thunderstorms, tornadoes, derechos, hailstorms, et cetera. Uh, once again, it's a mixed bag because these storms depend on a variety of factors interacting. Uh, warm weather uh, can actually act to suppress thunderstorms if it's warm aloft. Uh, you need a jet stream in order to make these things strong. If the jet stream is weakening, then they won't be as strong. On the other hand, if there's more moisture, there's more energy. So once again, we're not expecting to see a big trend in that stuff. Uh, what trend there is, is probably a seasonal trend. It's a little easier to, to put together the elements for a, a warm situation with a thunderstorm early in the season or late in the season. Uh, Nebraska is seeing more early and late season tornadoes than they used to and a little bit less in the middle of the season. Uh, to go even further south, tropical cyclones. And the answer there is once again, equivocal. Uh, what it looks like, the ocean contains more energy because uh, it's heating up these storms work off of that energy. And if everything is just right, you get a stronger uh, tropical cyclone. That's hurricanes and typhoons. But if it isn't just right, it might be harder to put together anything. For example, we have reason to think that the air in the middle latitudes uh, or the middle levels, I'm sorry, the middle levels of the atmosphere might be drier overall as global warming continues. And if that's the case, then it's going to be harder to, to uh, get a, a tropical cyclone started in the first place because they, they just dry out and can't get organized. Uh, so those are some things that, although there's probably a popular narrative that they're getting worse, uh, it's a, uh, if they're getting worse, it's probably a local thing. It's not overall. Once again, different ocean basins when it comes to uh, tropical cyclones may very well be affected differently. And there, as the ocean warms up, there's a little more potential for early and late season storms. But we do have to watch when it comes to tropical cyclones that when they reach peak intensity, they're probably going to be getting worse and worse. Okay, now we get to stuff where we do have uh, more definite indications. Precipitation extremes, yes. And that goes for both 
drought and flooding. Uh, the atmosphere can hold more moisture if it gets uh, warmer, but that moisture may or may not be available. If it is available, you get a bigger rainstorm. If it's not available, then you get a worse drought because things evaporate worse. Uh, so the other thing with that is that the probability of getting either one shifts. So somewhat paradoxically, uh, you're running into increasing probabilities of getting both droughts and extreme rainfall events at the same time because you're cutting into what's happening in the middle. Uh, so the, uh, I'm going to get more into precipitation later. Uh, heat extremes, yes, that one's kind of obvious is global warming increases, uh, temperatures overall tend to increase. Uh, also, uh, cases of extreme humidity. And uh, this is because the, the uh, moisture in the atmosphere ultimately comes from evaporating the water from the oceans. If the oceans are warmer, they can evaporate more water. And under the right circumstances, that makes the humidity higher. And I'm talking here about absolute humidity, the amount of water vapor in the air, not relative humidity, uh, which is the amount of water vapor compared to what the, the atmosphere can hold. Uh, okay, and some of the other ones that you've been hearing about are melting glaciers, which is essentially a problem worldwide as we warm things up. It makes it easier for the uh, uh, mountain glaciers and ice caps to melt. Some of that could be catastrophic over time, although it takes a while for a glacier to melt. Once it's done, there's no going back essentially in a human lifetime. And finally, uh, we know that sea levels are already rising. As the glaciers melt, that gets worse, not only because they're uh, pouring water into the oceans that was previously stored on land, but also uh, as the oceans warm up, the water itself expands, kind of like the mercury in a thermometer. So both those things go into rising sea levels and they make uh, any kind of uh, storm surge worse. So that's the, I wanted to do the fast rundown in the meteorology and ask if there are any questions or comments and then get more into some of these uh, uh, more complex interactions. So anybody want to uh, question or comment? Uh, John, you said, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of your words, the ink blot thing. Um, yeah. So, so there's a lot of us who are, who are afraid of it, who are, are, are saying it's all evidence that it's bad. And there's some of us who are denied that say, no, 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 no. So ultimately, there's a whole lot of it that is, is not evidence. Um, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I, I guess learning or spending too much time on Facebook just kind of gets you, uh, I'll get you all riled, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, 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 teach you something. I don't know. Um, well, uh, I, I would tend to agree. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going after, uh, uh, knowledge here you know and I, the story at the beginning regardless of how we uh obtain it but what i want you know like the if the climate tsunami is coming i want you to not be looking at every wave and say oh that's a tsunami coming i want you to be able to distinguish between the real deal and stuff that's going to be happening anyway so that that's uh why I said it was looking like an ink blot and spent some time uh, checking on, uh, you know, checking off different phenomena and saying, well, this probably isn't directly related and this one probably is. And I saw a question from uh, uh, Amanda in 
chat, I believe. Let's see if I can get back to that again. Can you read? I can read it for you, John, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> it says, is there a possible positive result of heated atmosphere with increased water evaporation? If this water is released as rain, can more fresh water be available for people to drink? And that's a good question. Uh, the answer is yes, in some places, uh, but more often than not, it won't be the case. the The problem is the the uh, I, the places that are getting uh, water from uh, the extra evaporation. Uh, a lot of times are places that have enough moisture in the first place because the evaporation has to come from, uh, from the ground and the plants and stuff like that. If you're away from the ocean, it gets recycled. So Nebraska is mostly going on water that's uh, uh, may have had one or two trips uh, after it came from the ocean. Uh, and so, there will be circumstances that it's better and there will be places that are, that are getting better because they're getting more water that's been evaporated. Unfortunately, the uh, overall tendency is that uh, most of those places are getting enough water and they are liable to be getting too much or there are places that aren't getting enough now. So when the evaporation increases, it makes the, the drought tendencies worse. So the, all of this stuff, I'm speaking in generalities and there are specific places that can be affected differently. Are there any more? If we don't have any more, I'm gonna uh, devote the rest of the time and this potentially could go on quite a bit longer than we have. But uh, we'll, uh, Steve and I discussed this before, we're going to do a scheduled time and then sort of go on from there from, for anybody that wants to hang around and discuss it more. Uh, but the, uh, the first example I wanted to give of these more complex interactions, which are kind of uh, weather as it uh, butts up into other natural systems, but also human systems in society uh, is kind of a curious one. Uh, a lot of you may be aware that right now, one of the economic problems we're having is a shortage of computer chips. Uh, they go into all kinds of things these days and the manufacturing capacity right now doesn't equal the demand. Uh, one of the reasons for that, it turns out, is that uh, a big manufacturer of these chips is in Taiwan, and Taiwan is having a big drought with water restrictions, and it takes a lot of water to manufacture computer chips. Paradoxically, the reason that Taiwan is having a 50-year drought is because they are not getting enough tropical cyclones. So this kind of goes back to the evaporation question. They rely on those tropical cyclones for their water supply. They are near the ocean and they are not getting enough water because they're not getting enough tropical cyclones lately. So that's, that's uh, one of those surprising interactions and there are all kinds of those, including the one that I'm having with a cat right now. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, another type of, uh, in th this one is a, a human, but also uh, uh, nature interaction is wildfires. And of course, there's been a lot of publicity of increasing wildfires. And a lot of these are occurring in areas that get seasonal droughts, or are in semi-dry areas of the subtropics like Australia and uh, the Southwest US that are drying out even further because they're tending not to get their winter rains. So 
you have an interaction between human practices, which have been tending to make the wildfires worse, and uh, nature. And there are an awful lot of these different types of interactions that uh, happen. Another one, because we got a question about food and food supply earlier, uh, and what can we do about it? Uh, one of the things that really bothered me uh, was that in 2012, there was a very strong La Nina, which is uh, cold water out in the Pacific. And that had global ramifications. Uh, in our part of the world, we had an extreme uh, heat wave and drought that summer. Uh, we also had some of the same in Europe, but there was also a connection with uh, the Middle East where uh, parts of it had extreme drought and uh, other parts, uh, particularly the monsoon region of uh, uh, Southern Asia got too much rainfall and they had severe flooding and their crops got wiped out that way. And even in Africa, uh, Africa has sort of a seasonal rain pattern, much of it, and those seasonal rains got affected. Well, uh, the way this relates to climate change is that if you change the ocean temperature or the ocean currents, you coordinate a bunch of changes in the atmosphere that can happen all over the planet. And regardless of where you are, uh, everybody has sort of an optimum uh, weather pattern for the stuff that they grow. And if you disrupt that weather pattern globally, uh, which you do through the, uh, we did through La Nina to a certain extent, we could certainly do through a major change in ocean currents, uh, then everybody gets bad weather for where they are in terms of growing things. So uh, if everybody has bad weather, then there's less food to go around and the prices go up. And that's happened in the Middle East. And that was one of the things that helped trigger the, uh, uh, what they called the Arab Spring, which was a bunch of revolts all over the place. The price of wheat was going up. Uh, that included the, uh, uh, the civil war that's still going on in Syria. Uh, and I'll get back a little more to the, the question of what we can do about it. But one of the things that we need to be aware of is the fragility of our food production systems. There are ways to make that less fragile that we're generally not taking up very well yet. Uh, in particular, uh, there, uh, well, I, th I, think I'll, uh, I think I'll talk about this a little bit now. Uh, that a lot of times it turns out that we're building systems that are efficient on the large scale as long as everything goes right. But if something doesn't go right that we didn't plan for, we have a big large scale mess. Uh, Texas was kind of an example of that back in February. They had a cold spell that they weren't planning for. By the way, it, it was a uh, uh, severe cold by recent standards. But if you look back in the record books, they did have uh, a more severe cold in the past. So uh, you can't, uh, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't trot out the polar vortex idea for this one, but I'd say, well, uh, they had a severe cold spell that they weren't ready for. And the same thing is very much true for food crops to the extent that the foods, the seed supply and the fertilizer supply and everything else is controlled by large companies. Uh, 
it's hard to adapt if you've got all of a sudden the wrong seed for an area. Uh, if you know your corn seed may be optimized for one thing, but if you get something else, uh, it it won't grow. The traditional corn was yielding way less per acre, but it was very resilient. It was a subtropical grass that was bred so extensively that they were, before uh, the Europeans got here, it was yielding up into North Dakota. And so it, the corn has enormous genetic resiliency, but most of it has been bred out. And the same is true of a lot of other traditional crops where, you know, the farmers aren't as concerned with, uh, with having the best yield when conditions are just right. They're more concerned with having something to eat when conditions are wrong. So this is how, uh, one of the ways that I would relate what we can do is that we need more uh, local and regional autonomy for a lot of these systems, rather than insisting that the, the best solution for everything is national or international or, uh, oh, if you're short on uh, corn this year, we'll just ship you some. We'll be glad to sell it to you. Uh, if you don't have any money, well, tough luck. Maybe the IMF can give you a loan. That's not a good system for making sure that uh, people are fed or that they're taking adequate care of the, the land in their area. So uh, resilience requires a sacrifice and peak efficiency in order to, to get to uh, uh, a situation that is more robust to climate change and other types of uh, changes. Uh, another example that uh, I want to give for this is uh, to get back to flooding because we've had to deal with flooding and uh, in that case, resilience cuts both ways because we've got a, a large dam system on the Missouri River, but we also have uh, local systems of levees. We've got federal levees and uh, this stuff cuts both ways. It, uh, floods are na nasty disasters. Uh, People get killed, uh, you know, homes are ruined, livelihoods are ruined, and dams and levees can help, but they can also breed a false sense of security. Uh, I would note that in this country, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for determining what uh, areas lie within the 100 year floodplain. Uh, the two problems are that there is a general assumption that if you're not in a hundred year floodplain, you're okay. Uh, I've got news for you. If you're living in a uh, kind of a low flat area uh, near a body of water, chances are you're in a floodplain. And it, uh, it got there by periodic floods. Can't tell whether they were hundred years or not, but it did flood there before, regardless of what anybody tells you. Uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers is not in the habit of uh, looking for uh, climate change. So their idea of a hundred year flood hasn't changed. Uh, Don Priester, uh, just I saw his thing, uh, asked me to tell more about hope. So, uh, I think that's a good thing to do too. Uh, for one thing, when there is a disaster of any sort, including climate, people have a tendency to get together and help each other. Part of the resiliency we see in local systems is that people know each other, they know each other's needs, and they can look out for each other. But there is also a role for government at larger levels. And government can be quite effective if it's organized with an idea of helping to prevent and ameliorate disasters. Uh, one of the things in general is uh, if there is a uh, perceived role 
which I think there is, for looking out for imperiled people. When there's a disaster, people expect their government to step in and help them do something. And they don't expect them to say, well, uh, too bad, or here's a roll of paper towels. They expect uh, a larger scale organization than a community may be capable of to bring in resources to help out. That includes warning, which is what I was doing before things even hit. Uh, it includes keeping the communications going during the disaster, which is very important because a lot of times people are suddenly isolated. They have no idea what's going on and all kinds of rumors start to spread, which can be very pernicious. Uh, disaster relief, uh, storage of supplies and uh, ability to move them in case there is a disaster and also protecting uh, infrastructure. So, uh, and there are a lot of improvements that we can make. And for example, Biden's uh, infrastructure ideas, uh, what, what he's asking for is a tremendous increase in spending for all kinds of infrastructure. Uh, and if we can get the right balance between uh, personal participation in government, I see a lot of potential to improve things there. Uh, and finally, we've got uh, national and global efforts of which the uh, uh, Paris uh, Climate Agreement is one to really try to turn things around. Uh, and it is critical. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily know when this stuff is going to hit. Uh, we don't know when the targets on, are on our back, but some of these things, clearly when we heat the ocean up and uh, melt ice caps, this is going to be a problem for the history books. And uh, 500 years from now, uh, the students are going to be learning, well, the uh, industrial revolution, uh, they burned a lot of fossil fuels before they knew what they were doing and uh, melted the ice caps. And now there's all these problems that we have to contend with. Well, we're trying to avoid the worst consequences when it comes to that stuff, meaning that uh, we're going to be uh, getting hit with some stuff, but we're going to be avoiding some stuff through national and international efforts. Uh, same with uh, you know dealing with the oceans, which are getting more carbon dioxide in them. Uh, they're heating up. I've got news for uh, Bill Gates. Uh, if you try to uh, geoengineer, you might be able to cool off the continents, but it's really tough to cool out the oceans. And you're not going to get rid of that extra carbon dioxide that's in the oceans. Uh, you're affecting the whole biosphere. And all these interactions go back to understanding and appreciating the planet that we're living on, which is what we're trying to do with uh, Earth Day. And now I'll shut up for a little while and uh, get some more questions and interactions here. John, Tom Maroos, uh, thanks for, uh, for coming in. You're, you're speaking to the choir, I assume. So I speak to the climate boneheads more often than not. Uh-huh. Therefore, my, right now, my, if I tell them that you have grandkids that are going to be facing this, they said, yeah, but I'll be dead and gone. They'll, they'll, they'll help solve the problems. But my contention is, how, do, how is it affecting your pocketbook right now? I hear you say cost of, cost of food. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the disasters uh, have to cost in terms of 
insurance premiums for oh, yeah. everybody. Yep. What yep. else? Uh, what else is uh, disaster aid, which has been going up. There is a federal flood insurance program, which by the way, will not make you whole really if you get flooded, but it'll help. And that's been ladling out so much money that there is a vigorous debate on, you know, how, uh, how to cut it back. But meanwhile, when you do, you're affecting mostly, uh, uh, you know, people with lesser means. Uh, the same thing uh, with, you know, levies. The people with the most money get the best levy and the people on the other side of the river get washed out. But all that comes back to people who are displaced, uh, people who are moving from one place to another. Uh, hello, we've got a migrant crisis right now, both the US and Europe, because in part, not all, but in part, people are facing untenable living situations where they are. Uh, that's that's going to cost tax money. All this stuff, these are problems, that, large problems that affect society. <clears throat> and they're all being made worse. And we all have to deal with them right now. It's not grandchildren. Uh, you know, it's all happening right now. These disparities uh, in outcome for people are being fought out right now. And uh, so these are current problems. You may not get uh, killed by a lightning bolt next week, but right now society is under increasing stress and this is one of the big stressors. And I think most people are under some kind of personal stress because of that. And uh, even, you know, you referred to them at, uh, as boneheads in the beginning, there's a, been a lot of name calling and I'm trying not to do much of that because I'm assuming that uh, everybody is trying to cope with it from their standpoint of, uh, personal distress and uh, the person that comes to you with that is saying, hey, I've got bigger problems that I've got to deal with right now. Uh, tell me why this relates to me or I don't much care about it. Right. I don't call them boneheads to their face. <laughs> no, I know it gets frustrating too. So that that's that's my response to sure, that. Sure, sure, and you and you've added some things that uh, I can throw at them if they'll listen. Well, usually the key to listening, in my experience, has been to to take it on a personal level. What concerns you? Right. And see how I can relate to it from that. If uh, if what concerns you is that you're afraid that government's going to come in and take over your life. Uh, then what I might say as well, uh, the worse climate change gets, the more these disruptions are going to be, and the more of an excuse government is going to have to, uh, to take care of, you know, to take over where it, it doesn't belong. And the more fighting there's going to be about it, the more your life is going to be trying to fend all this off. Thanks, John. Say, John, oh, and, and everybody, um, we advertise that this is going to um, be 45 minutes, but people can stick around longer. And I really hope people do stick around longer. Uh, but because we advertise it at 45, um, I'm going to um, put up the participation code for those who want it and want to use it. Let's see, how do I do that? Uh, I give me a couple of clicks here and I'll have that for you. And then um, we have a couple of comments in chat that I want to share. Let's Great. see. Um, I think Don had one. I'm not sure if other people do. Ah, participation code. Mary said you need to give that. Yep, let's see. Okay. Why isn't my participation code? I, I will find this, but it's not. 
did that come up on the screen? I guess I, uh, I don't think I kept right doing <laughs> Give me a minute while we're doing this. But hey, John, while I'm figuring this out, um, <clears throat> the comments that some people made are, uh, even Don had a follow-up, uh, let's see, as our climate warms, what is the climatic, climatic cycle for, I hope I'm reading this, for a following mini ice age in the near future? Okay, that's a good one because it sounds like the the plot of a movie, which was very loosely based on some science. Uh, in the plot of the movie, the the Gulf Stream shuts down, and we do end up with a very abrupt mini ice age, and that's a, actually based on some uh, geological history. It was something that happened about. Uh, 11,000 years ago, and it was very abrupt. Uh, what's different this time, uh, okay, yeah, put the code in chat. Let's, uh, let, let's, let, let, let's see if we can get that code up so that people want to leave can, and then I'll go on with this. Okay. Type message here. I won't let it. It won't let me type it. Uh, Steve, are you trying to type it in chat or on the screen? Chat. Oh. We'll get there. We'll get there. Maybe you can just verbally spell it. Okay, I'm going to announce the participation code. It's three, it's three words, preparing for peril, which is peril as part of the title of this event. Preparing for peril, all lowercase, all one word. Preparing for peril, P-E-R-I-L. Okay, yeah, and I will, I will find out how to uh, <laughs> get this on okay. here. All right. Now, I, I, I just wanted to give people a, a break to, uh, ah, you got it. You got <laughs> it. Okay. Now I want to get on with uh, Don's question because it's kind of an interesting illustration. So uh, 11,000 years ago, things were pretty different. And apparently what happened is that the uh, there were continental ice sheets in uh, North America that were melting. And apparently a bunch of fresh water reached the North Atlantic at once that had been getting stored up uh, somewhere on the North American continent. And they're still arguing about whether it came up the Mackenzie River to the Arctic Ocean or uh, through the St. Lawrence River Valley but at any rate, the, the uh, water, the huge amount of water, meltwater from that continental glacier dumped into the Atlantic and that shut down the Gulf Stream pronto. That's within probably uh, less than a year. And there was a period of 1200 years approximately where that, uh, that Gulf Stream was shut down and then it started up again, almost as abruptly as it uh, quit. And this is the scenario that worries me the most. Uh, not because we would get a little ice age this time necessarily, but because the, uh, we still have that capacity to dump enough fresh water into the North Atlantic through the melting of the Greenland ice sheet that we potentially could uh, drastically reduce the Gulf Stream, and that would uh, affect uh, climate conditions across the entire planet because there's so much heat exchange going on uh, between the subtropical Atlantic and the, the uh, North Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean through the Gulf Stream. Uh, whether it would be a little ice age is another question because in this case, it's not in the context of a uh, 
of the North American continental glacier melting, it's in the context of the oceans getting warmer and warmer because most of the excess heat from global warming is going into the oceans and they're getting more and more out of equilibrium all the time, which by the way is another reason why this isn't necessarily just going to be a problem for our, our grandchildren. That out of equilibrium stuff means that we're building up the, the capacity for an abrupt change in uh, lots of ocean currents and not just the, uh, the Gulf Stream. And that can have widespread ramifications that we're not, we really can't, can only begin to guess uh, all of what would happen. What we can guess is that with the oceans being warmer, that it probably would not be a little ice age, although there'd be an area of uh, Northern Europe that's kind of uh, uh, downwind from the Gulf Stream that would, uh, would probably get a lot colder for a while. It would not be favorable for their agriculture, but probably, uh, you know, there'd be places in the subtropics where because the heat isn't escaping, they'd be getting warmer and more humid. Uh, we might be getting more uh, uh, hurricane activity in the Atlantic because the uh, tropical Atlantic was heating up more rapidly and so forth. Uh, about the only way to make a little ice age would be to have a very large volcanic eruption. And to tell you the truth, we're probably somewhat overdue for uh, trouble of that sort. If you look at the period, uh, it was about 125 years from the late 1700s to the early 1900s, we had three very major uh, volcanic eruptions, larger than anything we've had since then. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, Krakatau in Indonesia. Another one was Tambora. And a third was a big volcano in uh, Iceland, uh, uh, fiss fissure volcanic eruption. And there was a, uh, a large uh, hit of a, what they call a bolide or a you know, kind of a small asteroid that hits, fortunately, a very little populated area of Siberia. And that was all within a 125 year period. Uh, uh, since then, we've had uh, no volcanic eruptions on the same magnitude. Uh, we had one that hit Russia that was smaller than the one that hit Siberia. And the question is, are we feeling lucky? Uh, <laughs> Because that that could that's the kind of thing that really could temporarily uh, stop global warming and allow heat to come out of the oceans. Because when there's a a very major volcanic eruption, instead of heat going into the oceans, it comes back out and uh, goes into the atmosphere, which otherwise would be cooled off faster from the the haze of uh, the volcanoes. Okay. Uh, defined a weakened jet stream more. Uh, does that mean it has sections of larger north-south movement and its shape has a harder time maintaining a stable average along the latitude? Uh, that's a, another really nice question. Uh, a weak, what I would define it as is, uh, First of all, <laughs> asking for a definition is a little, uh, gets to the crux of the problem because meteorologists having, have trouble defining what they mean by a jet stream or wiggles in the jet stream. I've seen a bunch of different definitions of that stuff and pretty much everybody picks their own definition and goes from there. That's one of the, the difficulties of the research. And the reason that happens is that there's sort of a gray area. And rather typically, particularly in the winter wintertime, uh, <clears throat> instead of there being one jet stream, I'll see uh, two or three. And one of them might be uh, in the far north, uh, kind of staying mostly in the Arctic. One might be the subtropical jet. And 
they're not continuous around the whole globe. They're, they are in pieces. So part of the difficulty is de uh, defining things well enough that you can really put your finger on when something is definitely changed. And usually what they settle for is the average uh, wind speed north-south and east-west in a particular latitude belt and uh, in a particular time of the year. And if that average is changing, then uh, it's assumed that the jet streams are having to change to go along with it because it's pretty tough to, to change the average without changing the jet streams. And so that's what the researchers look at. It's the, the uh, the most common definition, and I probably went too far into the weeds on this, but you asked me a good specific question. Uh, and so the answer to that so far is that if you pick the winter season and you pick a latitude belt anywhere from about 30 to 70 degrees north, uh, there is a very slow average decrease in the wind speed uh, at the mid-levels of the atmosphere, say from uh, 15 to 40,000 feet up, uh, that is in line with the decreasing temperature difference between the, uh, the poles and the equator. Uh, this is expected to continue but there are a lot of different ways to come to that average. One thing that I didn't mention earlier uh, is that not only are we seeing this more loopy pattern of the jet stream now compared to say 10 or 20 years ago, but uh, we've seen that movie before too. So to me, it's tough to blame it on uh, global warming when uh, we had a similar period where things were more loopy and we were having some pretty awful noteworthy winters from about the mid 1970s to early 1980s. And by the way, there were a lot of extreme severe weather outbreaks during that period too, big derechos and tornado outbreaks. And if you go back to the 30s, things were, the jet stream was at least as uh, acting as loopy and weird as some people are saying it's doing now. So that's another reason for my reluctance to, to pin this all on global warming, is that the atmosphere has a lot of different ways of coming up with the same pattern. And you see it for a while and then it goes away for a while. And I wanna have something honest to say to the people that uh, when my expectation is that in 10 or 20 years, we're not going to be be seeing this uh, same loopy pattern to the jet stream that we are right now and all this slow moving, then I wanna be able to say to, to somebody in all honesty, first of all, we don't fully understand why it happens, but we know it's not all global warming and we wanna be prepared for the, the stuff that we know is uh, either going to, will result from global warming or that the odds are getting worse because of global warming. And the uh, jet stream isn't on the top of my list when it comes to that stuff. Uh, the, uh, the food supply, uh, rising sea levels, uh, people not being prepared for unusual disasters. Those are the kind of things that are at the top of my list. We have uh, more questions or comments? Okay, one of the things about climate change is there's more instability. Okay, my mind simplifies that down to uh, temperature-wise, there's more um, uh, weather, more days that are further away from normal temperatures than normal. Or mm -hmm. is, is, okay, that's the way my mind works. Is that true? Are there more uh, days that are further I away from yeah, what I'm going to say is not really uh, that the the problem is more that the normal is shifting 
And we don't really know how fast it is shifting or it's going to shift because pretty much what we get to look at is history. We can try to get there to the shift through, uh, uh, through climate modeling. Our models aren't good enough yet. What the models are good at is showing us the average, but most people don't really care about the average. We're used to dealing with something near average. We operate just fine in conditions that are near average for wherever we are. What we're really worried about is what you're talking about, the things that are way, way out of whack. And the only thing I can say there is that uh, it's probably getting more out of whack in one direction, the rainfall, uh, we know we're going to be seeing more extremes and we have to be ready for both floods and droughts. Uh, when it comes to temperature, we're probably going to be seeing more warm extremes and fewer cold extremes, uh, but we don't really know how extreme it's going to get. What we do know is that uh, ye, we need to pay attention to the electricity infrastructure we need to have stuff like community heating and cooling shelters so that people can get to a shelter uh, when conditions are not conducive to survival outdoors and you have lost your power, things like that. I mean, that's, a, that's a, almost a no brainer except that we're not doing it very well. Uh, you now we've got large homeless uh, populations, but also, as you saw in Texas, people who are displaced. And I would like to see more uh, uh, effort going into shelter infrastructure, even if it isn't used very often, because this gives people a margin of safety. Uh, the same thing can happen in uh, uh, tropical cyclone prone areas, even, even in low income countries it's not too expensive to build a mound you know get some bulldozers put together some earth uh put uh make a 20-foot mound and build a solid enough structure on top of that mound that you can uh shelter people there and uh ex in store food as well so there's something to eat and some water to drink uh so that's uh, that's that's the kind of thing that that I see. I've kind of drifted off your question, but uh, I'm I'm thinking about what what can we do about this stuff when we don't know exactly what we're facing in terms of extremes, only having a general idea. Okay, I got another question. Uh, we're in Omaha. And so we're not going to get a tsunami or rising sea levels aren't going to affect us directly. Uh, <clears throat> what do you uh, what do you recommend, sir? What should Omaha, Nebraska do? OK, Omaha, Nebraska uh, is here because it's a transportation hub. Uh, we're a transportation hub because we're in the middle of an agricultural area uh, and we've got the Missouri River. Uh, one thing that I would recommend for us is that uh, the big dams on the river, starting with Fort Peck upstream, need to be reinforced. We've got a real infrastructure problem there. We came uncomfortably close to losing the Fort Peck Dam in 2011. Uh, that was a big rain event upstream. Uh, if we lose that dam, uh, we're going to cut the country in half and we're going to wreck all the railroad tracks. Uh, we're going to take out uh, Omaha, mm -hmm. Kansas City, St. Louis on downstream. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers asked for money to refurbish Fort Peck. Uh, and they basically got the money for a pothole fix after that. And as far as I know, it hasn't been improved yet. So that would be high on my list. Uh, food storage, we, it's interesting. We do have a distributed food storage in the grain elevators around the area, uh, but we're seeing increasing concentration 
in terms of seed supply. So I think, you know, uh, regenerative agriculture, farmers being able to, to save and use their own seed and having control over their own equipment, because increasingly some of the large companies are trying to uh, say, well, uh, it's your tractor, but it's our computer chip in it, and you don't get to touch it, and you don't get the data, we get the data. Uh, I think that's a very deleterious form of centralization. Uh, there is care for local populations. There are always people at the low end of uh, the pecking order, and that's, you know, that's uh, uh, minority groups of all sorts, uh, and also includes low-income whites, and we need provisions for that kind of stuff, too. And, you know, there's sort of, uh, there's some effort going on there. Uh, I think, you know, my overall attitude is that we need to be be paying more attention to the have-nots than the haves, because one of the, you know, if for no other reason that some of these disasters, you may end up being a have-not when you're not expecting. That certainly happened in the 2019 flood, that a lot of people that thought they were safe and the levees were good are, uh, were in a world of hurt. Okay, I saw one regenerative agriculture. There was bills in the legislature. Did uh, I don't know too much about what's happening there, so maybe somebody else would would like to share on that one. Does somebody need to be unmuted there? You're working on it, Steve. Um, well, I don't know if Luke Luke had made that comment about the bill, and uh, he can. I uh, unmute if he wants. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, so there is a bill currently in the Nebraska Unicameral that deals with letting farmers have access to that. So um, the big, like John Deere, currently they don't have access to that kind of software. And for years they've been able to work on their own things. So it kind of pulls that um, away from the big, farm implement dealers to where you can work more locally again. So it, it kind of touched on what you were saying earlier about local systems and, and I don't, I forget exactly what you said about um, farmers specifically, but that is a little bit important for them to be able to keep going and keep bringing in a harvest and stuff instead of waiting on a technician just because they don't have access to that software and stuff. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but. Uh, it is helpful. Uh, what I was uh, saying was, uh-oh, uh here we go. <laughs> Naturally, I've got another line going. Uh, no, uh, what I was saying is that the, uh, the food supply and you know, all aspects of it are getting more centralized by the big agribusiness companies. So the, the farmers are, you know, and very much in touch with what they're doing. They ought to be able to save their own seed. A lot of the seed now is patented, which to me is kind of outrageous. When, I can, when you consider that most of the uh, breeding work uh, in corn uh, happened before the Europeans ever got here, uh, the idea that, you know, the, the last 20 or 30 percent of the breeding is the intellectual property of some seed company and nobody else should have access to it without paying them first is, uh, is pretty outrageous. And this story is repeated, uh, you know, for other crops and here in Nebraska and all over the planet. So that, that goes for that. It also goes for the data. Uh, now when the farmer runs the tractor in the field, not only can't they, uh, can't they fix the, the software, but the software is reporting their data back to the seed company so that they're getting the big picture and the farmers don't have the data to their own land. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, in a way, Facebook is sucking up all your data, but you don't get to see what the, 
what they find out. They know what to advertise to you, but you don't know what they're finding out. So it's the kind of the same principle only with agriculture and it reduces the resilience of the whole system to climate change or any other threat that's going on to the, the agriculture system. We have some more. Ah. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Mary, do, do you have more to say about that? I'm not as familiar with the what's happening in India. Hi, uh, all I remember is like uh, 10, 20 years ago, the India farmers, the poor, poor farmers, the sustenance farmers were buying into the company's program and they had to use the company's seed and the company fertilizer. And they were so distraught that they were committing suicide, you know, with the fertilizer or something. And I thought, you know, um, again, how cramped can people get when they have power? They, they take you to the um, extreme degree of control. And so any control that we can begin locally is to me positive. And that's what I want to support. Great, I, I do too. And uh, I saw Luke uh, actually uh, uh, posted the uh, LB. Five, four, three. Well, I think this has I've been. I've got another one though that oh, I great. like. <clears throat> okay, so uh, cool, very cool ideas. It's great to have that understanding of it. <clears throat> so, what what can we anybody that's on this? Uh, the presentation, what can we do? I mean, I mean, who do we ban with? What do we, how do we uh, make a change? Okay, you've got, uh, I mean, there, there are various things. Of course, there's going to be a lot of national legislation that's uh, dealing with, uh, they don't want to call it Green New Deal, although I think in essence, it's the same thing. But I think it's important to be supporting that. We've got uh, obviously, our uh, our senators at the federal level are are uh, in the the other party, and they're kind of opposed to that. And we're going to have to see how much uh, how much of this we can uh, get past the partisan barrier, to, just because it's good sense and people. Uh, you know, one one of the things that. I, well, I'm, I don't want to editorialize, but I'm just going to say that compared to people on the, the coast, okay. I think ne ne I, I think that Nebraskans have a good practical streak to get in there and do something and not worry as much about uh, party affiliation that is uh, uh, enshrined in the unicameral, but it, it shows in a community attitude in general that people are, are less uh, likely to just hold to a partisan stance because that's what their party tells them to do and more likely to do something because the job needs doing. So uh, I think that if to the extent that we can uh, convince people that it's a job that needs doing, that we will be, uh, getting away from the partisan narrative and making actual progress on these issues. Uh, the, the second thing is that certainly in the, uh, the local legislature, this stuff gets, uh, the state legislature, it gets thrashed out every session. So uh, it, to me, it kind of comes back to the, uh, the old, uh, motto uh you know think globally act locally 
globally we've got all these problems and you know we're just all of us looking for different ways we can apply ourselves and you know for me it's uh being a scientist but you know we're talking about how society functions and that takes everybody uh and it takes imagining new ways for people to do things so that we can have good lives and uh you know get away from using fossil fuels and all its ramifications i don't know if that got what you were uh, aiming at steve or not uh, no that was great that was great uh thank you um i i wish i had more uh representatives that i uh thought would uh listen to me uh but I, um but that was good that was good uh let's see people are posting or chatting some here real town hall meetings where people are civil and included that sounds good um for anyone that uh, came late, uh, the participation codes uh, was listed earlier, but it's in the chat right now. Uh, Don posted it. Uh, participation code is uh, preparing for peril. Look in the chat for that. Um, anyway, I, I think we've probably run our course for now, but uh, this is I'm glad that you ran an extra half hour. Um, this is fantastic. A whole lot of people stuck around for it. So, and a whole lot more people will see it as it's recorded. So, uh, John, thank you very much for, for doing this. Okay, thank you everyone for participating and I appreciate you all being here. <laughs> Steve, before everybody gets away, if anybody is interested, we could still use help in the litter clean up down at Mandon Park in Mount Vernon Gardens. You can stop in any time between one and four and help us clean up some litter. And my thanks to Tom Maruz and the tree board and the others who are out with us trimming trees this morning. So Earth Day continues. Thank you all. Thank yes, you. Check out, check out uh, uh, Nebraska Earth Day Passport. Um, there's more information, like uh, Don was saying, about the Mandan uh, Park cleanup and, and more stuff happening all the time. Hey, Earth Month goes on till May 15th. Thank you all.